in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall you welcome to another spirit filled message on christocentric message if you're new to this channel i would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video as well i would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth it's going to bless you your graces are going to be imparted onto you and then god is going to visit your home thank you for watching stay blessed and so for me it's been a concern for many years and a burden even up until now the kind and the quality of the average believers spiritual experience for many our spiritual adventure is a plethora of burdensome rituals rituals that may not seem to have life and power and many people are beginning to vent out the the age-long frustration as to whether it is true that there is what we call the joy of salvation. We were taught growing up that there is such a reality in the believer's Christian experience called the joy of salvation. And you hardly see believers demonstrate the confidence that comes from knowing the Lord personally and experiencing the faith life in its fullness and so my discussion tonight very briefly is to help um, to give us a clearer understanding as to God's idea of the gospel now I understand that I'm speaking to people who probably come from several denominational divides and here and there we may disagree or agree across different lines of thought but for the believer there are certain things that must be most surely believed among us. Luke chapter 1, please, for reference. Is God blessing us already? Luke chapter 1, we'll begin our reading from verse 1. Dr. Luke was speaking, and here's what he said. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are more surely believed among us that means there may be aspects of the christian faith that is still subject to various levels of theological debate there may still be aspects here and there that depend on the frame of our christian experience but the bible says there are certain things that are called realities that are most surely believed that means if you do not believe those truths, you are not a Christian. Regardless what denomination, regardless what Christian experience, there are certain truths that represent the epicenter of the Christian experience. Praise the name of the Lord. This is very important because you will be surprised how many members and how many preachers are completely ignorant of the truths that represent the foundation of the Christian faith the inability to have been so guided for many preachers especially has led to congregants who are sincere well-intentioned but not able to grow methodically you call the conference equipping the Saints and we must go back to the foundation to really understand what the gospel is when I get born again what am I introduced to from where where am I coming from what experience have I come into? What is the implication of that encounter? Do I have to be saved? Hallelujah. Because the inability to understand this truth will rob us uh, of the knowledge to be able to defend the truth that we know, even at times like this. Many believers are being lost to philosophies, lost to sadly westernization and most uh, Christians even those who try to preach and win souls are not equipped with the requisite level of intelligence to defend the gospel 
And so most of them end up being the converts of those they seek to convert. By reason of what I do, sadly, I have seen preachers who have preached the gospel for many years and decided to hang their ministerial boots because they had to research certain things themselves and they found out that they had been living in a lie for decades. Hallelujah. If we must stand like the early church, if we must be grounded in truth, especially at times like this, then we have to understand the gospel. So let's discuss very briefly. The word gospel comes from, just for a theological foundation, comes from the Latin word evangelium. The Greek is evangelion. They all together mean good news, glad tidings, or speakings that bring joy. So when you talk about the gospel intrinsically, it is not just a message about Jesus Christ. The very construct of the word gospel just means a message that if understood should gladden your heart. Hallelujah. That means the end product of understanding the message, the gospel of salvation, among the many things that it administers is joy. That if your Christian experience does not capture the joy factor, you did not understand the gospel. Because the very, the very essence of the word gospel means tidings that minister joy. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, please. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul the apostle was speaking to the church in Rome and here's what he had to say. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God, he says, unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jews first and then to the Greek. Very powerful. Please keep that scripture there. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because I have discovered something. That the gospel is the power of God. It does not have it. It is the very power of God. That means if I do not understand the gospel, I will always be ashamed of declaring it. So there is an explanation as to the laxity in evangelism. It is not just about demonic attacks. It is that most people, sadly, including those who propose to preach it, do not understand the the entire message of the gospel nor recognize the power that is hidden therein for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ he says for it is the power of god unto salvation to the jews first and also to the greek let's go to romans chapter 10 romans chapter 10 i'll begin my reading from verse 8 and then we'll end at 15 romans 10 8 to 15 Romans chapter 10 but what saith it the word is nigh thee it says even in thy mouth and in thy heart that is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead thou shall be saved he says, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He says, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. He says, for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, again it repeats, shall be saved. Two more verses. 14 says, how shall they call upon him that they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings, that bring glad tidings of good tidings. Are we still together? There are two dimensions to the gospel. 
the Bible theologically and Jesus in mentoring the disciples who would later become the apostles of the Lamb. Jesus showed very clearly that the gospel has two dimensions. Please listen carefully. The inability to capture all of these dimensions of the gospel will produce a side effect that will be felt even at a territorial level. Hallelujah. The first dimension of the gospel, and I'll take that for tonight, is called the message that saves. So there is the gospel as the message, not just a message, the gospel as the message that saves. And then there is the gospel as an ideology that transforms. There is the gospel as the message that saves. And there is the gospel as the ideology that transforms. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, the, the key to effective Christian living and even being a faithful witness is to be able to capture and even demonstrate in and through your life the reality of these two dimensions of the gospel. The message that is able to save a man and the ideology that is able to transform society. Please do not forget this. This is very, very important. For a very long time, the emphasis, justifiably so, has been the message that saves. And we have ignored the ideology that transforms. The side effect is that we have several individuals within our territory who are saved, but our world and our society is in danger. Are we together now? Yes. So an individual can be saved, but his territory can be unsafe. An example of this we find in scripture was the man called Lot. The Bible talks about Lot being a righteous man even in Sodom and Gomorrah. But although he was a righteous man, he was uh, um, in the midst of a people of decadence and he suffered the consequence of being in a territory that was not saved. Hallelujah. So that it takes more than your personal salvation to establish the purposes of God at a territorial level. If we are together, please say amen. amen. Let's discuss the message that saves. You can random pick believers across various congregations and have an honest interview. Ask them to defend their faith by helping you understand the life that they came into, the life we call the faith life. And you will be surprised and even get to the point of tears to know that many believers, respectfully speaking, including workers in church, including ministers of the gospel, cannot articulate the gospel in an intelligent sense that makes for understanding. You would find people arbitrarily, they call Jesus, they call salvation, they will tell you, I know I was saved from my sins. Several people would tell you Jesus is the answer. To what question? Are we together? So it is important for us to understand what we have come into. It was right in this very church that I was introduced to a small pamphlet called Four Spiritual Laws. And in it was a capture, a very intelligent yet concise summary of the gospel. It helped us understand the foundation of the Christian faith and then also gave us the empowerment to witness effectively without being a disappointment to the kingdom. I pray and hope that some of these things have not been lost today in the maze of westernization and over invention of strategies that may not seem to hold any kind of potency as far as soul winning is concerned. Hallelujah. What then? is the message the gospel of salvation 
you may want to write that the gospel of salvation is a revelation I'll take it slowly because I pray that we're able to write this. The gospel of salvation is a revelation of the Father's love. A revelation of the Father's love. Demonstrated or revealed in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. A revelation of the Father's love demonstrated and even revealed in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus to the end that man and creation be reconciled back to God. The gospel of salvation is a message that attempts to capture a revelation of the Father's love demonstrated and revealed in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus to the end that man and creation please take note you would you would observe immediately that the blessings of the gospel does not stop with man man was only the zenith of God's creation but not the only the gospel must be able to affect the entire creation Hallelujah. Limiting the gospel to man, as you will, will, will be looking at it shortly from scripture, limiting the blessings and the benefit of the gospel to man alone is inaccurate. Creation also were subject to the bondage of corruption by reason of the fall of man. And so the Bible says creation is also waiting to step into the glorious liberty of the sons. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. This is very, very powerful. So the gospel, the message that saves is a revelation of the Father's love. That means the, the initiator, please listen carefully, the initiator of the entire plan of salvation was God the Father himself. Jesus now came to the earth as a revelation and a demonstrator of that love are we together now there are many reasons why jesus came to the earth um taking us to heaven and giving us eternal life is only one but not the only reason we don't have all the time but it's important for us to understand that jesus came and walked the earth for many reasons i'll give you two for now number one being the ultimate reason was to be that bridge the, the means for reconciliation back to the Father through his substitutionary sacrifice. But number two, Jesus Christ came to the earth as a marking script to be able to re-edit our understanding about God. Because until Jesus was revealed, there were gaps in our knowledge about God. We had to depend on prophets. We had to depend on the law. And most of them, it was, their imperfections as to the picture they painted about God. Till today, when you read the Old Testament very, very intelligently, if you are not careful, at the end of your, your research, you, will, you would only arrive at a plethora of conflicting statements that seem to make God it gives God an expression that is not. So Jesus had to come as the revelation. The Bible calls him the express image of the invisible God. You find that in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Verse 1 says, God who in sundry times and diverse manner speak to us in time past through the prophets, he said, had in these last days spoken to us through his son whom he had appointed to be heir of all things. Hallelujah. And then he calls him the image of the invisible God. This is very, very important. Are we still together? So the Bible starts by giving us a picture of God's mind and God's idea. Genesis chapter 1, when we read from verse 26, the Bible says, And God created man in his image genesis chapter 1 please media are we working together 
Genesis, okay, let us make man in our own image, he says, and after our likeness. Hopefully, in, in the subsequent sessions, we'll, we'll be dealing with all of this. We have to understand the very creation of man because the Bible says man was created in the image of God and the likeness of God. The image of God is a spiritual quality. The likeness of God means his functionality, the way God functions. You have to understand how man was designed to be able to maximize your living as a Christian. But that's not where we're going to. 26, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we see God's original idea and intention for man. That he created man to legislate on this side of his kingdom. It was God's idea that man would have the opportunity to dominate over creation and become an unveiling of the multifaceted dimension of his glory. But then the Bible tells us that something tragic happened. Hallelujah. Talks about the fact that Adam and Eve now walking in the garden, he left them an instruction. And he said, of all the trees you may freely eat. However, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou may not touch that in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Now this is very interesting because God said the day they eat of it, they will die. And yet we do not see them die on that day. What then is death? Because we have to understand God's idea of death. When he says you eat of this tree and you will die. And yet we see Adam living hundreds of years after. In fact, Paul was explaining the concept of death. And he said death was a natural consequence of the, the power of sin over the mortal body of man. So God's idea of death is not cessation from living. In fact... I hope I do not trouble your theology, but I hope you know that the word translated eternal life is not very accurate. Um, this is not to create any theological debate, but the word eternal life there um, is supposed to be the life of God. Because from a theological standpoint, everybody lives forever. I hope you know that. When you preach to sinners, you don't ask them, will you spend eternity? The question is location, not possibility. Everyone will live forever. Read your Bible and you read the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Sin one, they are both on earth. Sin two, outside the earth, you see that they were both alive. Are we together? I'm saying this because hopefully in this journey, we will define what God calls life and define what God calls death. That a man can still be alive and yet God says that man is dead. Adam was still living and yet an instruction was given that the day you violate this, you will die. And we do not see cessation from breathing. It means therefore there are many, many people who are dead even though they are breathing. And there are many people who are not breathing and are still alive. This will give you what we call the hope of glory. That even though you have lost a loved one, it is only the body that has been disconnected to the spirit. They are as alive, they are more alive and active as you will ever know. This will now give you hope. You see, the, the believer's confidence was not supposed to be derived from physical maturity or just intellect. It's supposed to be derived from truths that were put in scripture. There is something about scripture, the character of scripture that when you find, it can give you the strength to look at a dead body and still find hope. There is no amount of growth and maturity that can immune you from the impact of losing a loved one. You have to outsource your strength from the knowledge of scripture. That means if I see a dead body, for instance, it is only the body that has been separated. Paul says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Not to be on a journey. You are present that instant. 
is God equipping us so that when we stand to preach to sinners we are not just satisfying the guilt of not of um, of not being lazy spiritually for many people evangelism is a burdensome ritual that they have to do because they are in a position where they cannot explain otherwise it is this revelation that will plant in our hearts a genuine desire to see sinners saved only if we understand the gospel praise the name of the Lord so the Bible says man in disobedience something happened to Adam and then to Eve the Bible says that he took off the fruit and gave unto Eve and then the Bible records that their eyes were open I wish I had the time I would have shown you from scripture the character of Satan and how he tempts men because his strategy is still the same when Satan came to Adam notice that even Satan had to respect the organogram that God created Satan could not there was no place in scripture where Satan had the authority to talk to Adam directly no the Bible says he came to Eve are we together now Apostle Peter was teaching us that Adam was not deceived it was Eve that was deceived Adam fell because of love it's in your Bible are we together now so Satan please follow carefully all Satan wanted was that dominion remember what brought him down from heaven the sin of treason and rebellion was because he desired to be like the most high that was his manifesto I will as ascend above the stars of God and I will be like the most high until iniquity was found in him are we Bible students and now wanting to get that that dominion mandate the authorization to rule and to reign in this side of God's kingdom he had to get it from man notice that in the garden of Eden Satan did not need Adam did not need to fear Satan there was no discussion between both of them the middle person was Eve and the Bible says Satan through his subtlety he beguiled Eve is that true and when Eve took it she gave her husband who was there with her Eve was deceived Adam fell because of love why am I explaining this to you you have to understand this to understand the plan of redemption because the plan of redemption was still between the second Adam and his Eve too that Eve now being the church are we together now that the same way the first Adam was not deceived the second Adam came from heaven willingly out of love to come and die for his bride he was not deceived Jesus your second Adam he came willingly and offered up himself are we together now to correct what happened and now Satan still tries to get that authority that was in that Adam and he's still coming to Eve his church the same strategy in the Garden of Eden using deception over Eve the same way Satan would not let us rest is God speaking to us this is the gospel so as a result of the fall of man certain things were lost in the Garden of Eden let me hurry up three things essentially were lost number one the first thing that was lost according to Scripture was the departure listen very carefully please the departure of the Holy Spirit who represented to man the life of God the Holy Spirit had to leave number two man lost righteousness that's a very important important expression in understanding redemption man lost righteousness men like E.W. Kenyon would and then the third thing man lost was the mandate to dominate the earth please you need to understand this so you will 
You have to know what man lost. I repeat, number one, man lost the life of God. Personified in the person of the Holy Spirit. Number two, man lost righteousness. The ability to now stand guiltless before the Father's presence. Number three, man lost the legal, the legitimate authorization to be the God of this world. He handed it over to Satan. And I wish I had the time. I would have shown you how the transaction happened from the Garden of Eden. Because the Bible says that when Satan, watch this please. When God came in the cool of the day, here's what he said. Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, I heard your voice. Notice that even God respected the protocol he put in the garden. He never spoke to Eve till Adam gave him permission. Adam, you are the one I put in charge here. I put the woman to help you and to support you. Where are you? Where are thou is a very important question. Because he, he would have, I mean, God all seeing eyes and he's asking where are you? He had lost a position spiritually. There was a position of dominion that God could see even in heaven. Now that space was empty. Adam, what happened to you? He said, I heard your voice, but I hid because I was naked. The next question, who told you? We'll discuss that hopefully tomorrow. The power of influence. Who told you? You have opened up your spirit to the influence of another that is inconsistent with my value system. Who told you? Every time a man deviates from God's ways, the question to ask is who told you? Who have you submitted your mind to to influence you? Who gave you an idea that being spiritual does not translate to being successful? Who gave you an idea that you have to choose between your salvation and a great life? Who told you? And he said, I am. He said, I ran, I hid myself because I was naked. And he says, who told you? He says, have you eaten of the tree? The first demonstration of irresponsibility and selfishness in the Bible. The woman, he said, that you gave unto me. You see that now? Not my wife, not whatever, the woman. Now notice, please, I want you to learn this. Notice that every time... You give excuses and demonstrate irresponsibility. You transfer your authority to the one you are blaming. This is a principle in scripture. The moment Adam said, listen, it's not my fault. It's the woman that you brought. That means if she were not here, I would still be intact. He went straight to the woman and said, woman, the authority has come to you now. This man, by demonstrating irresponsibility and not admitting that he needs help, he has transferred the authority to you. And the woman said, me too, the serpent. The one who ended up having authority in the garden was the one who kept quiet. Hmm. Man spoke, transferred his responsibility to the woman. The woman spoke, transferred her responsibility to the serpent. The serpent kept quiet. Now you will understand why Jesus kept quiet when he stood before Pontius Pilate. They asked him questions. Can't you speak? And he kept quiet. He was not just quiet because he didn't have what to say. This is already a lesson. If you talk every time you have something to say, you are not strong. You have to learn to keep quiet sometimes even what you, when you have what to say. It was in the silence of Jesus that he restored man back. So man fell. I will say learning. This is very, very important. Every time, please let this be something you take back. Every time you demonstrate irresponsibility and you transfer blame through excuses, you give authority to whatever it is you are blaming. Satan became the God of this world very clearly to the point that when you read Matthew in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, when let's start our reading from verse 4 the bible says this is the temptation of jesus there were three temptations that jesus brought to satan and they represent the three major temptations that must happen to every man on your journey to rising to 
the zenith of your spiritual experience, you must pass these three tests. Number one, turn stone to bread. That means focus on your belly. You can lose your destiny like Esau and Jacob for hunger. And Jesus passed that test. The second test was the test of spirituality. He took him to a holy temple and said, fall down. After all, angels will hold you. The test of great men is that they fall. And the final test was the test of wealth and influence. The Bible says he took him to an exceeding high mountain. Now, when you read the Bible, sometimes you will wish some things were not written there. I'd like you to use, use an actor's mind. The Bible says Satan took Jesus. Took. To take means you hold the hands and say, follow me. And yet Jesus followed. Satan is holding Jesus. He's not shaking and crying and disappearing. So just because you are holy and sincere, it will not automatically drive Satan from you. In fact, if you read your Bible, when Jesus prayed and fasted, that was what even brought Satan. Read your Bible. I hope we're still... We're still friends this night. How the word of God is praying and fasting. And as soon as he's done, the first person he meets is Satan. So when you are praying and fasting, you need to know what you are doing. It was not the prayer and the fasting that drove him. The prayer and the fasting were vehicles. When you honor the vehicle more than the experience, a vehicle is not more powerful than the destination. This is the reason why there are many burdensome rituals among believers with no potency and power. Because our focus is on the ritual, not what it is leading us to. That is, we'll leave that one for tomorrow. But I hope God is helping us. We call it equipping the saints. God is giving us knowledge. You know what this is doing to us by the privilege of God's grace? Dominion, you may have heard me say it in this kingdom, is not a gift. Dominion is not an impartation. Dominion is the byproduct of your comprehending the ways of God. Spiritual intelligence is what translates into dominion. When you say, Satan, leave my life, he does not leave because you are going or because the Bible says he should leave. It is from the strength of your knowledge that the authority in the kingdom flows. Are we together? So the Bible says very clearly that when Satan took Jesus, he showed him to one of the synoptic accounts. says that he said bow down to me and I will give you this in other words Satan is saying the wealth and the influence I don't need it please do not miss any part of this conference especially tomorrow I want to show you something very powerful because the Bible says he took Satan I mean Satan took Jesus into not on top of into an exceeding high mountain and from that mountain, he showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory. Where is that mountain? Today. Where do you stand upon that you will see all the kingdoms of this world and the glory? There are levels of exploits in this kingdom you will never be able to attain unto until you overcome this temptation. Now you will know why, for instance, a secular musician can sing anything and still have influence because there is a transaction that happened on this mountain. In this mountain, you see, the commodity of exchange is not goods and services, it's your soul. What shall it profit a man when you gain? He's using a business description. You gain the whole world and lose your soul. So you can use your soul as a commodity of exchange. And when you give your soul, you can get this as a reward. Influence over territories. That's why he said, I wish above all things that you prosper. But that in prospering, make sure that your soul also prospers. 
because the economy of Satan will never allow you prosper even as your soul prospers you can know who Satan has empowered because the higher your wealth and your influence the more your spirituality and your passion for God but when you rise in influence and still maintain spirituality it shows that you have tapped into the economy of heaven is God helping someone wherever we can stop tonight we'll pray and continue it's a conference but let me find somewhere to tie it and then we'll pray remember we're looking at the message that saves so the Bible says that man fell and according to Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 very powerful scripture it says the soul that sinned it shall die I did not define a very important terminology in dealing with the matters of redemption and the gospel is the word sin what is sin um, people have brought different kinds of meanings and expression to sin sin means two things according to scripture essentially number one rebellion number two disobedience that's it sin in one word is rebellion as seen in the life of lucifer sin in according to adam and his fall is disobedience so no matter what greek and hebrew expression it boils down to two things disobedience and rebellion what is rebellion a willful continual violation of god's known principles there are consequences that's where we get the word iniquity he says if i cherished iniquity in my heart the lord would not hear me hallelujah so now we see that there is a condition the soul that seen it there is a verdict already the bible says that soul shall die do we agree this is from scripture the soul that seen it it shall die romans chapter 3 and verse 23 romans chapter 3 and verse 23 if it is true that the soul that seen it it shall die then it means all of us according to this scripture the bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god all the, every one of us including babies including children in the womb the only difference and that's the reason why children don't go to hell if you've been asking that question let me answer it now the reason why there are no babies in hell is because the nature of sin without the partnership of your will cannot send you to condemnation there has to be a participation of your will for it to be credited to you personally he said in iniquity did my mother conceive me however you've not gotten to the age of discretion to discern right and wrong and willfully choose and if God sends babies to hell, then he has violated the character of his person in giving man the ability to choose between life and death. That means, let me also answer the question, what happens to those who die and never hear the gospel? There is a system of judgment allocated for them based on scripture. They cannot be judged like those who have heard. The, the, the verdict of condemnation is only released to your life at the instance of your hearing and rejecting Jesus. When you read your Bible, you will read that when Jesus went to Hades, the place of the dead, Apostle Peter tells us that he preached to the departed saints. Is it in your Bible? He gave them an opportunity and they believed and Jesus marched out with them being the firstborn of the begotten and many of the departed saints arose with him and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. This is Bible. Praise the name of the Lord. So based on this verdict, the Bible concludes that all have sinned. All means the educated, the uneducated, all means male, female, all means whether you are european american africa for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of god so the verdict of death becomes a verdict upon everyone is that true based on the integrity 
of this scripture. But Ezekiel 18 and verse 23 now begins to introduce to us what we call the mercy of God. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 23. Here's what it says. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live. This scripture now began to introduce to us the possibility of a state and a condition where man can be bailed out of that verdict. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that everyone who sins, the verdict already is that you will die. So if God is to be just, all men should die. And I hope you know his justice still prevailed. The only difference is that one man died the death of the all men. But that death had to happen. Are we together now? If this is a thousand naira, it must be paid for to be taken. And then I pay for it for you. For you it is a gift. But for the one who sold it, they still paid it. Are we together now? Yes. This is very powerful. It is from this scripture now that the person of Jesus comes into the equation. Jesus is the epicenter of the gospel. It starts with an old story. But somewhere in your journey of understanding the gospel, if you do not find Jesus, you are in error. No matter how accurate your foundation is. Because every, no matter where you start from that story, the converging point is Jesus. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Jesus shows up for time's sake. And here's what the angel said to Mary. Matthew 1 21 he said and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus why for he shall save his people from their sins is the Hebrew word Yehoshua Jehoshua where you get Joshua God our salvation that's the name there so the name already captured everything that Jesus would come to do now Jesus shows up through the womb of a virgin. Do you know why this is important? Because this is the frame, this is the pillar of the Christian faith. How he was born matters. The Bible takes out time to meticulously tell us that an angel comes to appear to a young virgin and tells her that you will have a son and that you will name that son Jesus for he will take away the sins of the world Mary was perplexed and said how shall these things be seeing that I know not a man he said the power of the highest shall overshadow you that means the next time God tells you something and you say how shall it be the answer was already in scripture every time you are asking Lord how will this thing come to pass the answer is that the power of the highest will overshadow you now Jesus is born and when Jesus is born, the spirit of the Antichrist begins to move through Herod. Why? Because there cannot be two kings within the same kingdom. The birth of Jesus, they use prophecy and they look for Jesus. Isn't it amazing that Jesus could die as a baby? That's why the angel said, run away and hide him. Run away and hide him until Herod died. And he went back and said, now you can go. They that seek the life of the child. Because of the birth of Jesus, there was a cry in Rama. Two years and below, children were killed. That immediately tells you Satan is not as accurate as we think he is. Because the spirit of the Antichrist had to kill people at random. There are many things about Satan we have been made to believe. Satan was also created. He depends on many things about the saints to also learn the ways of God. They kill children. And then the Bible says Jesus, according to Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, that Jesus increased like every other child in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and with men. Hallelujah. And then for 18 years, in fact, at age 12, the Bible says, isn't it interesting that at age 12, he was just getting into teenage where his colleagues will be running up and down but the bible says jesus was found in the temple preparing there is a strong message right here because 
excelling in destiny is a product of timing the bible says it is good that a young man bear his yoke in his youth every time is not the right time there are times you can maximize destiny at age 12 your jesus was already preparing for that assignment theologically speaking for the next 18 years we will not hear about jesus again now there are many kinds of debates as to what happened during those 18 years it's not for me to bring it tonight but the next time we see jesus he's a 30 year old young man going to be baptized of john john is now baptizing and the nature of john's training was that he was introduced that whoever he saw the spirit come upon that was the messiah so john would baptize and look and say you can go john would baptize and look and say you can go he got angry insulted people called them brood of vipers he was and finally he looks at this 30 year old gentleman and by the spirit he says behold the lamb who takes away the sins of the world he said look i have seen you in the spirit i am not even worthy to untie the latchet of your shoes and jesus makes a very powerful statement he says suffer it to be so the word suffer means permit it to be so that scripture be fulfilled let me tell you this no matter how great you are no matter how mighty you are you cannot open your own heavens jesus the word walked under a close heaven for 30 years until he encountered john the bible your bible says that he now submitted to the ministry of john when he was dipped out of the water and he came out is it in your bible he says and the heavens open over jesus had he started ministry before that time he would have been surprised and there was a voice from heaven this is my beloved son the spirit of god came upon him as a dove resting upon him and there was a statement from the father there we see the trinity very clearly the father is speaking the holy spirit in the similitude of the dove is resting upon him and the son now receiving the spirit and he said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and he commanded creation to hear him that was the beginning of the ministry of jesus news went all over town i'm wrapping up now imagine in the plateau that people suddenly begin to tell you there is a young man in town we don't know where this man is coming from but strange things are happening another person is running and saying my mom just became healed by who that same young man another person is saying can you imagine supernatural supplies oh what manner of man is jesus we sing but i hope we know what we're saying you just picture it this man turned the city upside down if he came around your area you would begin to rejoice because everything that was wrong would be made right immediately he came to the house of peter and saw his mother-in-law with fever he literally held her this is your jesus so that when you say i want to be like him you must be sure of what you want to become like are we together The Bible says when it was evening, they brought unto him all kinds of people and he began to preach and say, repent. Now the kingdom of heaven is within your reach. The word repent is a kingdom word. We'll deal with that tomorrow. Repentance is not for sinners. Repentance is for those who want to become like Christ. You will learn that for as long as you desire to be like Jesus, the language of repentance must remain with you forever. To repent means as we look at him, we see the areas where we have heard of, so we repent. To repent means to realign. Most people hate to use the word so that they show that they are not sinners. Repentance is a kingdom word. Show us the ancient path. Will you lead us along eternal highway? we want to follow the ways of jesus we want to enter your rest 
Show us the ancient path. Will you lead us along eternal highway? We want to follow the footsteps of Jesus. We want to enter. Please give me five minutes and we're done. Jesus began to teach and he began to demonstrate to them the life of the kingdom. Then he gathered 12 people to himself to walk with him. Notice the instruction he gave them. Please listen, don't miss out of anything the Spirit of God is saying tonight. When Jesus called the 12, the first mandate was follow me. No matter how great you want to become in life, when God calls you, he does not call you to ministry. He calls you to himself. The first assignment is not follow it. Follow me. And he leaves you with an assurance that if you follow me, I will make you. My goodness. He does not only make fishers of men. He makes anything. There is a name he is called. The maker. The man standing before you today is a testimony that the maker still makes. But he only makes those who follow. Follow me is a journey of faith. It is the riskiest journey of a believer. Because follow me means you do not know where. You only know who is going. Follow me is a risk in our world that is obsessed with guarantees. Where are we going? And God says follow me as proof that you trust me. There are many people today who cannot excel. Because they do not know how to follow him with the simplicity of childlike faith. If it be thou, bid me come. He said, come. Today we do the things that God has helped us to do. Not because we are any powerful in ourselves. No. It is simply because we have mastered the foolishness of followership. That you never fail following him. You may not understand, but you follow him step by step. Our fathers and our elders here will tell you that they have gotten to where they have gotten to today by the grace of God because of blind followership. If he says move, you say yes, sir. There are many people that when the devil wants to destroy them, he will give them visa and they will go out of this nation, out of the will of God and roam around like Cain and return back in pain. It is important to know that your victory as a believer is not generated within you. It's derived from your being in the will of God. When he calls us, he teaches us the excellency of his will. Follow me. Follow me. Is God speaking to someone? For someone, this may be your message tonight. God is saying being scientific about your destiny alone is a risk. You have been excessively intellectual. Brain work says go left. There are times that God will produce wine by telling you to fill the pot with water. It does not make sense, but follow him. You see, let me tell you this. There are times where you can go to the, the sea. That is where you find fish. There are times where you can have a good boat. That is the tool for fishing. Your net can even be good and yet you will not catch fish. Some trust in horses, others chariots. He says, but we, no wonder he, when God wants to use men, he strips them of everything that makes them sufficient. Until you are empty, you are not ready to be used of God. So when he calls you, when he asks you to follow him, Usually you will follow him with a backlog of all the things that represent your experience and your strength. So he will step back and allow you to exhaust them. Sadly, they will fail you one by one until they get to a point like Jacob where there is nothing you are standing upon. Then he comes. The strength of God does not look for strength. The strength of God looks for those who are weak. You will be learning hopefully tomorrow that it was not strength that defeated Satan on the cross. That weakness is what defeated Satan. Weak people are truly strong people. Anytime you see weakness, fear it. There is strength there. 
weakness always kills strength. When you see people who look weak, they are strong indeed. For when I am weak, he says, then I am strong. When you come to God and say, Lord, my destiny is great and I do not have the power to make meaning out of my life. That position of brokenness and weakness is attracting the strength of God. He will come and pick you on the wings of his might and do wonders with you. You will be the first, the first spectator of what he does in and through your life. I know what I'm saying. His strength does not look for people who are full of themselves. When Jesus came to be used by God, your Bible says Jesus had to strip himself of everything that would make him God until he was weak in himself. The Holy Spirit could not come and pick him. When the oceans rise and thunders roll, I will soar with you above the clouds. Father, you are king over the flow. And I will be still and know you are God. My soul be still. We'll continue tomorrow, but I want us to pray for a minute or two. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for in it, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Believers, we have come to a season in our life and even in this church where God wants to make strong people. He says, but the people that do know they are God. Not the people that are aware he is there. The people who know they will be strong and they will do exploits. Jesus Christ is the epicenter of the believer's Christian experience. Tomorrow we'll take our time to tie up why he died. Why did he have to die? Why did he rise again? The Bible says that today he's seated, exalted as Lord and King. Do you know why that is very important? It is not everything about Jesus that saves you. I hope you know that. There is an exact information about Jesus you must believe to be saved. For instance, believing he's a prophet does not save you. For instance, believing he was a good man, you are right, but you will not be saved. There, there is an exact information about him you must believe to be saved. So you can know whether you are saved or not. Not just by your longevity and your stay in church. Let it be known to you, O Israel, Peter preached the first message after Pentecost that this same Jesus has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. In fact, here's what he said. I hope this does not disrupt this service. We're going to pray. I'm sure that many of you may probably have watched or learned what God has done and is doing in the life of this man. I am your son. I am your brother. I'm not a stranger from somewhere. I hope that tomorrow in the course of our teaching, I will share with you a few of my encounters to be able to inspire someone here that there is nobody God cannot use. I found this Bible and I believe. I said what I said now because by the privilege of my work with God, as some of you may have known, he has opened me up to dimensions of supernatural possibilities as revealed in scripture. And sometimes it's very difficult to contain these things, especially when the hearts of people are opened and very hungry to receive. There are people who came here and whilst you are sitting down listening to me, this same experience, something is burning within your spirit like the two men that went to Emmaus. Did our hearts not cut us? That this is not just a preacher speaking intelligently. This is more than intellect. This is the spirit of the living God 
calling men to come back to the foundation that will give stability. Many of our children, sadly speaking, respectfully speaking, have not encountered Jesus based on the definition of the gospel. There are many people across the body of Christ who are well-intentioned people, but based on the provisions that the Bible makes for salvation, we have not encountered Jesus. I'm going to be making an altar call if you would allow me. Is, am I okay with that? Thank you. But just two things I want to do. While I was teaching, I just saw light. And I saw three people here. And of these three people, the Lord just ministered to my heart to tell you that you are the Savior that is raising even over your family. And I wanted to help them because I just saw light. I took out time to explain the things that I explained because I know that I want to respect the protocol and not do anything that is outside of our norms. And my apologies if I violate any the modus operandi. But this, if we gathered and we prayed, I know that much prayer has gone in this meeting. So please let me just pray. I want to pray for you. There are people that God is going to be calling into deeper levels. Equa Plateau Church is entering a new season. Believe me when I tell you this. It's a, it's a season our fathers have prayed and cried for certain dimensions of the move of God. Not from a religious standpoint. As I watched our fathers now old men I still remember their burden and their passion helping us as children and God has come again to honor it so I'll just pray and I'll make an altar call father all these ones that you have brought in the name of Jesus by the ministry of the spirit I am praying for you now that in Jesus' name, who is the Son of the Living God, for many of you, that fire that you had Reinhard Bonke talk about, that fire that you had T.L. Osborne talk about, that fire that you had Peter Younggren talk about, those who have joined the cloud of witnesses, they came to just hear your city many years ago. I have come with that fire that you will experience Jesus, not just as a the founder of a religion but as the king of kings and as the lord of lords the savior of the world now hear me i want to make an altar call there are people seated here you are saying my dear brother I have heard you and I know sincerely that I need Jesus. There are people who are saying, I know for sure that my life is not the way it should be. I have been around church, but I want to, based on what you have taught, I confess that I do not know him. And there are others who are saying, if you give me the chance, my life has gone haywire even though I remember making this decision. I'm tired of playing church and playing religion. I need Jesus. Please may I request that if allowed, I want you to come and stand here. I want to pray for you. There's no need being ashamed or being afraid. Be the first person, whether you are inside, you are outside. If you can make your way here, please I want you to come and stand in front of me. Don't wait for anybody to come first. Be the first person. Win that war. I know there are people, forget about who is looking at you at your left and right. Let's celebrate them as they come. Please come and stand right in front of me. I mean it with Jesus. No shadow you will light up. Mountain you will climb up. Coming after me. No wall you will kick down. Lie you will tear down coming after me. Please come. Join them. 
coming let's celebrate them some of you are saying I want to come but I'm ashamed of my friends I'm ashamed of my family members no this is a conference where you mean it with Jesus and make that decision he says it is appointed unto man to die once and after that the judgment the Holy Spirit has come to convict you no matter what else you learn about God if you do not subscribe to the truth of the gospel, you are not a Christian. You may be a member of a church. You may even be a worker in church. But it takes receiving the life of Jesus by acknowledging his substitutionary sacrifice. No wall you won't lie you won't tear down. Hallelujah. Thank you very much for this bold decision. May I please request that you lift your right hand high above your head as a sign of surrender to Jesus. I'm amazed to see even the children coming to Jesus. You know, Jesus said, let the little children come. And he says, do not forbid them for for such is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to pray this prayer. Some of you are crying. There's nothing to be ashamed of. The Bible says, as many who will come to him, that he will in no wise cast away. When you come to Jesus, you are not coming as though you are a failure who is being pitied. See yourself as though you are coming to receive an award, except that this surpasses every other one you have received. It is the very life of God. It says, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And that this life was structured such that you have to receive the son to have that life. Please say after me, everyone. And for those who are watching by television, you're watching from any nation. Here is your time and chance to give Jesus your heart completely. From your home, your office, from any nation you're connecting. Even if you're watching by way of rebroadcast. Here is an opportunity to make Jesus Lord of your life. I'd like you to lift your hand and say after me loud and clear, Lord Jesus, I believe in you that you died for me. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive into my heart your life, your grace, your spirit, your righteousness. I declare that Jesus is Lord of my life. I declare that you are my king and I declare that you are my savior. The power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. I declare that I am a child of God. From today, I go forward ever and backward never. Amen and amen. Please keep your hands lifted. Father, thank you. The Bible declares that no man can come to the Father except through the Son. You have brought these ones by your Spirit and by your grace and we thank you. By the authority of Scripture, I declare that your sins are forgiven. And in the name of Jesus, I call you recipients of the life of God. I declare that from tonight, I commend you to the ministry of the Word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That you be grounded and established in righteousness. You will go forward ever and backward never. For in Jesus' name, I pray. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to do for me. Um, there'll be someone waving their hands or someone, just uh, some counselors. Let's celebrate them as they just walk to the aisles there. Please, let's, let's celebrate them. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You'll meet with a few counselors. They'll have a word or two with you and then you will be back to your seat. Hallelujah. 
I understand that there is another session tomorrow in the morning by 10 if I'm right and then the final session with me is in the evening. May I encourage you please make the sacrifice to plan so that you can come and learn some of the things that we're going to be sharing. It's a conference that seeks to equip the saints and I trust that at the end of this conference that our lives will never be the same in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn your ways to understand the gospel clearer. Thank you for the honor that you have given to lead this many to Jesus. Thank you because the entrance of your word, the Bible declares that it gives life and understanding to the simple. We pray that this that we have heard tonight will remain in our spirits and it will produce fruits 30-fold, 60-fold, and our desire is a hundredfold in the name of Jesus. For everyone who departs here, I pray that they are blessed in the name of Jesus, that you will return back with testaments of the hand of God upon your life. May the Lord bless you and increase you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Are you blessed today? If you are blessed, just thank Jesus. Say, Jesus, I thank you. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. I give you glory. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. Alaska de Pasca Nakata Branda Catecatos, Cate Branda Catapacotosco to break a take a letter. The face of development, Lord, grant me.